back to science here. All right, so on Friday, by the way, your quiz grades may or may not be posted today. May or may not. <laughs> Depends upon you how much. Graded Friday. They're graded, I just haven't posted them yet. <laughs> Depends if UConn wins tonight, I could not do anything for the next three days. <laughs> anyway, um, I will try to get them posted with tonight at some point, maybe while I'm watching the game. Okay? Um, with that, we have quite a bit to finish before your next exam, which is when? Next Friday. All right, so it looks like your exam will basically be viruses, bacteria, and archaea, and whatever else we finish from there. Okay? So to do that, let's work through our bacteria. What, we were going over bacteria on Friday. What, we said a couple things. What do we know about bacteria and prokaryotes in general? They're small. What? They have a cell wall, outer membrane, inner membrane. What's the, what's the main component of the cell wall? Peptidoglycan. And what's the, what's the difference? Some bacteria are gram-positive, some are gram-negative, and the difference being what? More right, a thick thickness <coughs> of the wall, right? How thick the cell wall is. All right, and then Sarah just said uh, nucleoid. What's a nucleoid? And that's where we're going to start today. A region. Do you want us to answer? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yes, I want you to answer. It's a region in the cell that DNA is like contained in, but it's not. Really All right, so it's like an area where DNA is collected, okay? But it's not membrane-bound, and it's not separate from the rest of the cytosol, okay? It's not a, a nucleoid or nucleus, the nucleoid, all right? So, with that, we're going to go through some specialized membranes today um, that support metabolic functions, all right? Some specializations of the internal organization of cells, all right? And what in eukaryotic cells performs a lot of these metabolic functions? What is metabolism? Abby? All right, so the mitochondria, all right? And the mitochondria, through the endosymbiotic theory, believe, says that what? Where did mitochondria's closest ancestor is what? There was a cell before, with type, a prokaryotic cell before. All right, so you'll see that sort of the internal organization, the membrane portions of bacteria resemble what you'll see in terms of a chloroplast or a mitochondria. All right? All right, and so those are usually foldings. All right, so here you see aerobic prokaryote versus a photosynthetic prokaryote, and if I had scanning electron micrographs of a mitochondria and a chloroplast, they may look quite similar, all right? But what you see is those little darker gray lines are infoldings of the plasma membrane, all right? There's, those infoldings create separate spaces, right? In internal and external spaces, which allow for concentration differences of ions and then movement of ions through diffusion, and that allows for the production of ATP and other metabolic reactions. All right, so these infoldings that you see here are important for what's going on in the cell. Same thing in the photosynthetic prokaryotes. Thylakoid membranes, where did you see thylakoids before? In the chloroplast, all right, same thing. So this, this the similarities in structure between mitochondria and prokaryotes and chloroplasts and photosynth photosynthetic prokaryotes is an example uh, or evidence that supports the fact that they have evolved from prokaryotic ancestors. 
Questions on that? All right. The prokaryotic genome. In terms of complexity, which is more or less complex? Eukaryotic DNA or prokaryotic DNA? Eukaryotic. Is it more or less complex? More. more. Why? It's got more stuff. More genes? All right. More complex genes? All right. So we have introns and exons. We have more genes. What else? Organization. How is it arise, arranged in the cell? All right. Chromosomes? All right. They have separate parts. Large amount of DNA. It's, it's within the nucleus. It's structured in such a, such, a way, such a way so that it's all compacted. So we have nucleosomes, histone proteins, et cetera, et cetera, right? So all of that gets in the way. Prokaryotic DNA, prokaryotic genome, roughly much smaller, tends to be about one chromosome, circular chromosome, easier to translate, easier to transcribe, easier to replicate, right? No need for compaction or um, condens condensation. Why? Don't need to. Doesn't need to fit in the nucleus. Doesn't need to fit in the nucleus, but mit mitochondria or prokaryotes are much smaller than eukaryotic cells. No. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, why no need for compaction? Hmm. It's so small to begin with. So typically, on the order of one eukaryotic cell has about a genome, a human genome is somewhere around 3 million base pairs. Okay? Somewhere around there. All right, eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells, somewhere, the largest genomes that you see is about 63,000 base pairs. That's about one of the larger genomes for a prokaryote. So, orders of magnitude dis difference, all right, in terms of the number of base pairs and how big they are, okay? With that, though, their bacteria have a <coughs> ability to pick up pieces of DNA. What is that called when they pick up pieces of DNA from the outside? Come on, you did it in lab. Plasmids, yes. What about plasmids? It's called what? Transformation. Remember? Oh, look, I didn't think I'd have to remember that. Yes, you will. Okay? Transformation. So with that, when in lab, you added some extra chromosomal DNA to the, out, to the outside, right, to cells that had already been sort of prepared in a way that had, there were holes in the cell wall, DNA gets in, and it begins to be expressed. Okay, that's, that's a plasmid, right? But extra chromosomal circular pieces of DNA, right, plasmids. So here's a scanning electron micrograph of bacterial chromosome, and you can see over here there's little ring, plasmid there, another little ring there, extra chromosomal DNA, all right? Three pieces, extra chromosomal pieces of DNA, example being plasmids, all right? And this being the chromosome in general, all right? What's that white thing? Probably just an artifact of the of the scanning electron micrograph. It, it's not like a nucleus or anything, but it's just probably DNA collected and then an artifact of the of the procedure. So, all right. Some differences in eukary eukaryotic and prokaryotic transcription, translation, all right, gene expression. What are some differences? can occur at the same time at, the, at in prokaryotes. There's no separation between cytosol and nucleus. Avid. Prokaryotes are less 
All right, so less regulation, all right? There's also a difference in the type, the size of ribosomes. Both cells, eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells, have ribosomes, right? All right, but there's a difference in prokaryotic versus eukaryotic in terms of their size and structure of ribosomes. They're a little different, okay? And what you can do is exploit that difference. Okay? Most times bacteria cause problems for you, right? In terms of disease, pathogens, infections, right? But if we can exploit the difference of cells, you, you or prokaryotic cells, that produce, you exploit the difference in their ribosomes, and you can target a drug to, to target that difference, you could ideally produce an antibiotic that attacks just bacteria and not your normal cells, right? And that's exactly what researchers have done. One type of antibiotic called actinomycin D, right? Which some of you may use for, um, it's it's in, for it's like in acne creams like retinol A, and actinomycin D is an antibiotic used for uh, <clears throat> in those retinol A or um, retin A acne creams which you may have heard about. <clears throat> it's used, and it specifically targets bacterial ribosome. It does not target eukaryotic ribosome. So it stops protein synthesis in bacteria and not in eukaryotes, all right? And there's other uh, types of antibiotics that also do that. So they inhibit bacterial growth without harming eukaryotic cells, all right? Those are called which type of antibiotics? They inhibit bacterial growth. Antibacterial? It is antibacterial, but we... we talked about two types of antibiotics. Two types can be either what we call bacterial cytal or um, bacteriostatic. Get rid of that L. Okay. Bacterial cytal refers to actually killing the bacteria. Right, doing something. Penicillin targets the cell wall, right, breaks, causes holes in it, and then cause, causes it to break down. That's a bacterial cytal antibiotic. Bacterial static, like actinomycin D, will prevent growth. Right? It's not going to kill the cell. Right? It's going to stop and halt protein synthesis, but it's not going to kill the cell. Okay? It's not going to kill the bacteria. It'll stop it from growing and reduce its growth rate, right? Which is important because why is growth rate important in, in prokaryotes? Why is growth rate important in prokaryotes? How fast do they grow? Fast. So if we can halt, slow down the growth rate, we can allow the immune system to overcome right, any infection, right, fight things up. Okay. Now, bacteria, prokaryotes are adapted to live in extreme environments, or a, not ex some live in extreme environments, let's say that, but they are adapted to live in diverse environments, marine and aquatic environments, marine environments, on the surface of tables, on the surface of your teeth, in your gut, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So with that, prokaryotes can be categorized on how they obtain and produce energy, all right? So we can talk about phototrophs versus chemotrophs. What does phototrophic mean? All right, photo refers to light, trophic refers to what? Trophism is what? How you obtain energy. Okay? How you obtain energy. So if you're a phototroph, 
light, energy from light. Okay? Typically, phototropes would do what? Which process? Photosynthesis. Okay? Chemotropes, a little bit different. All right? They obtain energy from chemicals, all right? some type of chemical. All right? <clears throat> and you will, a lot of chemotropes are used in process of bioremediation, right? cleaning up chemical spills, right? oil spills, etc. All right, autotrophs, they require carbon dioxide as a carbon source, all right, Keep autotrophs. So if, you're pho if a cell is photoautotrophic, what is it? It can do what? Obtains energy from light, so probably does photosynthesis, and utilizes what as a carbon source? CO2. CO2. All right? And then your heterotrophs require some type of organic nutrient to make organic compounds. All right? So let's talk about E. coli. Is E. coli, how do, you, got, you, you guys grew cells in lab on plates, right? Over, overnight, and then there you saw them the next week. Correct. What do they look like? What did the next week? What did that plate look like? <clears throat> like lots of dots that were colonies. The colonies are, what? Bacteria growing together. That's your E. coli cells, right? What was in that plate? Agar. What's agar? It's a nutrient. It's a sugar. Okay? So, tell me, classify for me E. coli in terms of its energy and its carbon source. What would it be? Would it be an autotroph? Yes or no? No. Why? Right, so use the agar to grow. If it, if it used carbon dioxide as a, as a carbon source, it's, it's sort of available in the atmosphere, it would have diffused it and used it that way. All right, so, but it needed some type of sugar, agar, right? All right, so it would be considered a heterotroph, right? Would it be chemo or auto? Uh, chemo or, f or photo? Chemo. Chemo, so it's a chemo heterotroph, all right? And which chemical would obtain this energy from? Hmm. Probably from the agar, glucose, right, et cetera. Right, so, so you have to consider glucose as being a chemical, all, all right? So we have photoautotrophy, chemoautotrophy, photoheterotrophy, and chemoheterotrophy. Which one does E. coli fit under? Chemoheterotroph. All right, cyanobacteria, which is the largest type of bacteria and includes green pigment, right? Very closely related to chloroplasts that are found in plants. What would that be? Photoautotrophic. All right, so photoautotrophs would lightly do some type of photosynthesis, CO2 as a carbon source. Chemoautotrophs, right? Where's their carbon source going to be? Some type of chemical, but would develop, you know, energy not from, not from a chemical itself, right? <clears throat> they produce the energy themselves. <clears throat> Photoheterotrophs, right? They use some type of chemical and also light. And then your chemoheterotrophs, such as E. coli. All right, so you should be able to sort of, if I gave you the characteristics, sort of like we're doing now, <coughs> you should be able to classify prokaryotes into one of these four nutrition modes. All right? All right, so here's some more examples. I think I've given you enough. We don't need to go back through that. So you have photosynthetic <coughs> prokaryotes, all right, unique to certain uh, prokaryotes, so this, uh, uh, Sulfobus for chemoautotrophs, they use inorganic chemicals such as hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, ammonium fixing bacteria, etc. 
Now, if you take, decide to take microbiology when you get as an upperclassman in the next coming years, you'll go into these modes more, more in depth, all right, and learn about nitrogen fixation and so on, okay? Oxygen is also important in the role of how prokaryotes have adapted and, say, their life cycle, or let's say, how they work, all right? Their metabolism dis differs. Why? What do you know about bacteria? What happens to, how would you classify bacteria that live in the presence of oxygen or utilize oxygen in some way? Aerobic. What does aerobic mean? All right, they you use oxygen for something. All right, we talk about aerobic exercise, aerobic metabolism in, in um, eukaryotic cells. Oxygen is being utilized for something. All right, so we could talk about obligate versus faculative aerobes. All right, so aerobic or aerobes meaning that they utilize oxygen somehow. Obligate. What does the word obligate mean? If you're obligated to do something, Nick, like come to class, what does that mean? Forced. That's a good, all right, you are forced. There's, you have no alternative, okay? So an obligate aerobe for prokaryotes, meaning that it has to use oxygen. Oxygen is necessary, required for cellular respiration for their metabolism, okay? If oxygen is not there, those, pro, those bacteria, those cells are not going to grow, all right? Conversely, obligate anaerobes. What, what does anaerobic mean, all right? They don't utilize oxygen. So if it's an obligate anaerobe, that means what? Oxygen absolutely can't be present. If oxygen's there, that bacteria actually dies, all right? And the point of this is that oxygen, how is oxygen used in eukaryotic cells? What's the point of oxygen in eukaryotic cells in terms of metabolism? Abby, you just said it. What did you just say? Well, all right, sort of carbon fixation, but really about how we use and metabolize glucose, right? How do we use and metabolize glucose in your eukaryotic cells? Cellular respiration, then what? Glyco like cellular respiration. Glycolysis. Darn, that's from first semester. Glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and then, Rob, electron transport system. And what's the absolute endpoint of the electron transport system? All right, oxygen. Water is produced as electrons are moved along the electron transport chain. All right, eventually gets to oxygen, which then is reduced to water. Okay. So oxygen serves as the final electron acceptor. In obligate anaerobes, they have to use something else. They do cellular respiration, they do glycolysis, right? They do these other processes for metabolism. They have electron transport chains to produce ATP. But the absolute endpoint is not oxygen. It might be sulfur, it might be some other chemical, whatever it might be. Okay? But it's just not oxygen as an electron acceptor. And then somewhere, so you have at one end of the spectrum obligate aerobes, at the other end of the spectrum you have obligate anaerobes, and then somewhere in the middle you have bacteria that can kind of take it or leave it. All right? These are called faculative aero anaerobes. <clears throat> they can survive with or without oxygen. If it's there, great. If it's not there, who cares? Okay? And that can speak to 
the fact that they may or may not use oxygen as a, an electron acceptor, but they're not tied to it. Okay. Other important chemicals in terms of metabolism. Nitrogen. What is nitrogen used for in the body, in cells? Go ahead, Sarah, read the first thing. All right, so amino, amino acids and nucleic acids. Why is nitrogen important for nucleic acids? Nitrogenous bases, right? Adenine, cytosine, thymine, guanine, and uracil are nitrogenous bases, meaning they're based upon <coughs> nitrogen, right? So if they're going to produce and have nitrogen in it, they need nitrogen from the outside somewhere, okay? Amino acids. What is the structure of an amino acid? Nick. Has a central carbon, right? What's on one end, what's on the other end? We have a carboxylic acid group. How many of you have taken organic chemistry? All right, how many taken biochemistry? All right, we have an R group, which is the difference between amino acids. And then what's over here? We have a, a carboxy terminus, and then we have a something with nitrogen. Thanks, Nick. We have an amine group. Right? So we have an amine group. That's what makes, well, one of the defining characteristics of an amino acid. Okay? So the amino part, the acid part. Okay? Okay? So nitrogen, absolutely essential for these things. All right. And prokaryotes can utilize and get nitrogen a lot of different ways. Some ways, one way is nitrogen fixation. All right. They do this by taking atmospheric nitrogen, which is roughly about, I think it's about 35% of the air we breathe is nitrogen. Okay. Don't quote me on that. It's a large portion of the air we breathe. I don't know it off the top of my head. All right, but the fact of it matter is they take what's available to them in the atmosphere and they f fix it to ammonia, which then they can use for metabolic purposes. All right, so instead of that's an example of a, a chemotroph, all right, which will utilize some type of chemical for energy, all right, or and this is an example of that uh, process. Okay. And then also with that, because of the different adaptations in, in how they utilize chemicals and obtain energy, right, they also can cooperate for this metabolic purposes. All right? So you will have sort of a relationship between prokaryotes. One prokaryote, such as E. coli, utilizes, say, carbon or utilizes glucose as a carbon source, right, and um, does not need CO2. Actually, it will produce CO2, but it will live in the same area of another prokaryote that will utilize CO2 as a carbon source and provide something else for E. coli. Maybe that's a photosynthetic bacteria that utilizes CO2 to produce carbon, to produce carbon, utilize carbon and will utilize light to produce glucose, which then can be given to the E. coli, and so they sort of play off each other, right? Metabolic cooperation. The end products of one bacteria is actually utilized by another set of bacteria or prokaryote. So they sort of work together. Example being cyanobacteria and anabana, all right, photosynthetic cells and nitrogen-fixing cells called heterocysts or heterocytes. They exchange metabolic products, right? One's producing glucose, all right, utilizing CO2, producing oxygen, and the next one is fixing nit nitrogen and providing um, some type of chemical for the photosynthetic cells. Okay, so they're sort of back and forth. All right, here's your photosynthetic cells and your heterocysts together, <clears throat> all right? Another example, biofilms. You all woke up, bro at some point brushed your teeth, either 
before or after breakfast, hopefully. Probably not Ben. Okay? In some prokaryotic species, those biofilms are meant for protection, right? They produce py polysaccharides on the outside, and they work together in terms of a, a community in order for protection and also for attachment to the enamel on your teeth, all right, for example. All right, so surface co coating colonies called biofilms. That's plaque. Plaque is an example of a biofilm. <coughs> All right? <clears throat> so diverse metabolism. They can use light, chemicals. They can use carbon dioxide as a carbon source or other chemicals as a carbon source. All right? And they may or may not require oxygen. They may or may not utilize nitrogen in different ways. Overall, what are we talking about? A diversity in terms of their metabolism and how they interact with the environment, right, and how they produce energy from their environment. <clears throat> Reproduction. Describe for me reproduction of prokaryotes. Give me a one word description of how those cells divide. Fat. Most of you would probably play quick, fast, rapid, Efficiently. right? Efficiently. All right, so quick. Normally, one cell will divide in prokaryotes in about one to three hours, as long as the environment's permissible to. Okay? Comparison to eukaryotic cells, most human cells divide in about 24 hours. All right? So you can think about the number of bacteria over say a bacteria's doubling time, meaning it's how long it takes to, to replicate, is an hour as opposed to 24 hours in eukaryotic cells. How many more bacteria are going to be there in a 24-hour period? <laughs> Lots. So you go, you know, in 24 hours, how many times? It's like 2 to the 23rd power. That's the number of bacteria that will be there as long as the <laughs> environment is permissible to D that doubling, all right? And the reason why this occurs, they're small, they don't have, right, they're not very big, so they don't have to grow very big to have to double. They reproduce by a simplified mitosis, basically, which is a process called binary fission, and they have short generation times, so they can reproduce very quickly. All right? <coughs> so, prokaryotes. Their success is a function of their diversity and their adaptive adaptations that allow for that, right? Because they can live in all these different environments, their abilities to utilize what's around them have given them great success, right? <clears throat> and that can be viewed as a great wave of adapta adaptive radiation in the evolutionary history of life. Wow, that's a very grand statement. But it is, speaks to the fact that they can live in basically anywhere. And depending upon the environment they're in, they can adapt to utilize what's available to them. All right? Questions on that? So the next part of the chapter talks about how they reproduce. All right? Rapid reproduction. Right, short generation time, small, we know they re re reproduce quickly, all right? But with that, because of the rapid reproduction, they also have a high rate of mutation, all right? Which is a benefit or a, a disadvantage? Sarah says both. Why? All right, so yes, for the most part, you're correct in that mutations could be beneficial, right? And they also could be disadvantageous, all right? In terms of prokaryotes, what's the benefit of having <laughs> a mutation and a, and a very quick, rapid um, doubling rate? 
they adapt quicker to the new environment. Example, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. All right, you all know Tampa Bay Buccaneers. It's a pro professional football team, correct? Yes? No? All right, Tampa Bay Buccaneers is a pro professional football team. They had a little problem this year with what? MRSA. What's MRSA, Nick? All right. It, MRSA stands for, MRSA stands for methicillin resistant staph aureus. All right. Staph aureus is a normal bacterium that is found on your skin. Okay. However, in some cases, it will develop a mutation which then will start to basically become a flesh eating disease. Okay. And cause infections. It can be, can be pretty, can be as severe as a flesh eating disease or as less severe as being sort of just a, an infection, a staph infection. Okay? The typical treatment is a methicillin based antibiotic. But now, because this bacteria grow really quickly, they have a high rate of mutation, at some point, some of them have mutated to be methicillin resistant. Now they're really hard to kill because that's sort of the, the line of antibiotics that they use to kill this bacteria. Other bacteria, other antibiotics don't really work very well. That's a problem, right? They're, the ability of prokaryotes to mutate and reproduce quickly have led to their ability to adapt and have a diversity in terms of their metabolism, the environments, et cetera. All right? And we're going to talk about how genetic recombination leads to that. All right? So they reduce by binary fission. Binary fission is basically... Like I said, a simplified mitosis, where, what's the end point of mitosis? Two genetically identical cells, okay? And so genetic variation comes when we talk about meiosis. Most likely we have crossing over, especially crossing over, you know, um, independent assortment, splitting cells, whatever, splitting chromosomes, and, and you get sort of four different genetically varied cells, right? That doesn't happen in bacteria. So mitosis, cells split, you get the same, ideally the same genome in those two daughter cells, okay? And that's sort of how bacteria divide. DNA replicates, it splits, and then you have two new cells, all right? At the end, those cells are genetically identical, all right? But mutation rates are more, mutations are more prevalent in prokaryotes, not because they mutate more in their DNA replication, but because they grow so fast, all right? So if you said the mutation rate in bacteria is one out of every 50,000 base pairs, okay? But if a genome is 50,000 base pairs, that means a mutation rate happens every generation, and now you talk about 24 generations in a day, those are 24 possible mutations that could have accumulated over the last day. And every day that'd be, right? So the mutation rate is dependent upon the reproductive rate, okay? <clears throat> and then what that allows for eventually is for rapid evolution, which can be seen in terms of antibiotic resistance, all right? <clears throat> so this is sort of a, what does this graph show you? What's happening in this graph, first off? Nick? It's showing for growth over All right, so you're showing growth rate over, over generations. So what have they done is they've taken... They take a tube of E. coli and they grow it up, okay? It'll grow at a certain rate, and they take a portion of that and, and put it into a new tube, what they call a serial dilution, all right? Basically, what they're doing is always having 
a small population of cells transferred over and giving them all the nutrients needed, an environment permissible for fast growth. Okay? And then they do that over time. And you see you have over generations. So you have generations on the x-axis, right? So you look at generation, 0 to 5,000. What has happened in the generation between 0 and 5,000? Over 5,000 generations. So you're looking at like 5,000 hours. So the growth rate has gone from 1 to about 1.5. What does that mean? So now instead of grow, you know, a generation time of one an hour, it's about 1.5 an hour. And then what has happened over time, though? Plateaus. It sort of plateaus. So it's sort of, what has it reached? Sort of its limit, its genetic limit over time. Right? Then... What would you expect to happen if I added antibiotic to this? Instead of, say, just taking this, let's say I added antibiotic to this serial dilution every time. Now, from the old tube, I started with, say, no antibiotic, and now the new tube is a small amount. What's going to happen to that graph? What's it going to look like? What do you think is going to look, what it's going to look like? So install my projector. All right, so what's going to happen to that graph over time? So, so, I'm going to ask, so I'm going to go from, let's think about this intuitively. I'm going to go from no antibiotic to a little bit of antibiotic. What's the growth rate going to be? It's going to be, we'll say we're going to start here. This is going to be, we're going to start here. This is going to be our starting point. It's going to be more or less than one in the new tube. How many of you think it's going to be more than one? Why would it be more than one? Okay, but now I'm anti but I'm adding antibiotic. So it'll be a little bit less than one. All right, so we'll probably start somewhere down here. All right, maybe not zero, but a little less than one. But now what's going to happen? Now I'm going to take it from a tube. The next generation, I'm taking it from a tube with a little bit of antibiotic. To another little bit of antibiotic. Now it's going to adapt, right? So now is it is the is the growth rate the inc the rate of increase going to be the same though as if it was with no antibiotic? No. So what's the slope of that line going to look like? It's going to a little bit, probably a little bit less, sort of like that. Okay. So the slope will be a little bit different. Is it still going to plateau? Yes. yes. All right, so it's going to be a little bit less, and then actually probably around generation 5,000, it's going to pick up, and then it's going to plateau. All right, why would it pick up a little bit later? Why would that growth rate pick up a little bit later? It now has adapted to the presence of the antibiotic, and now it's just like not even there. Now then it takes off, you get that really high exponential growth rate over time, and then eventually will plateau off. All right. Questions on that? All right, we'll pick up there on Wednesday. Your quiz grades will be posted prior to Wednesday. All right, we'll see you guys then.